everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I have another Dance Experts episode and we're really notching up on expertise today guys. I'm very excited um, because I have Dr. Peter Levat with me and I'm sure many of you already know his work but we're going to get to deep dive today not only into dance as a performance but dance as it relates to human beings in general. So as you guys know it's one of my favorite topics. Um, so Peter I could really start many places with your long career and like huge experience but I thought an interesting place that we could start today is the moment where there was this bridge between dance and psychology can we start from that place and let's see where that takes us <laughs> yeah well well now of course that that's a big bridge I mean that was a big bridge for me the joining of dance and psychology together I'd always previously found them to be completely separate parts of my life so I danced and I danced as a kid, I danced professionally and I loved to dance and that was all always going on. And then I became a psychologist and then I was studying cognitive psychology and the brain and how the brain processes languages and everything else. And the moment for me really came when I thought, well, it's funny, I was at Cambridge University at the time and there we were looking at language learning and we were talking about people's L1, which is the first language they speak and their L2, which is their second language, and L3, which is their third language, and so on. And as scientists, we were trying to understand how does the brain process those multiple languages? You know, how does it do it? Which is a, a great challenge to look at. And it occurred to me one day that the verbal language, your L1, is not really your first language, because the first language you have is movement. You know, we yeah. communicate so much through our body when we're before we're verbal. You know, we, we communicate our desires, our needs, our wants, a whole range of very kind of primitive stuff. And when you look at other animals, some animals are able to communicate some things through the, through the movement of their body, you know, whether it's fear, whether it's anger, well, whatever those core emotions are. Um, so I thought to myself, wow, actually, what if we were to study dance? And Because dance and body movement are the same thing. What if we were to study those with the same scientific rigor that we were studying how the brain processes language? Well, what would happen then? And so then I started looking at a dance through a well through a scientific psychological lens, and uh, and that that's where it really started for me that that coming together of those those two disciplines. Wow, I love that so much, um, and it's it reminded me of a small version of a, a similar process maybe, which is. When I started to research, this is when I was doing my master's like 12 years ago, um, the evolution of dance, I thought, OK, let me see what's in the literature. There wasn't very much at that point. And I thought, OK, let me go to music then. And then eventually I was led to language and I didn't think it would lead me there at all. But there was so much of exactly as you said, well, language uses also parts of the motor cortex and all that, all those kinds of things. And I was like, that's fascinating how language, as you just said then, that just clicked. Of course, it's not our first language. Our first language is movement. And I love seeing it in that lens. Can you talk a little bit about the difference then between what we can actually express through the body versus words? And I'm sure there's a huge overlap, but I'm curious about your thoughts on the difference. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So now verbal language, some people have said that our verbal language only accounts for a small percentage of our communicative intent. So when we're communicating those words and we wrap the words up in body movement. And of course, there are some cultures that use more body movement than others, too. Mm. But we know also from gesturing that when we're gesturing as we're speaking, we communicate. And what's amazing about that is people are picking up on those movement signals while you're speaking. And this is why people can spot ulterior motives. Mm. You know, if it's the way you move your body and the way the sometimes the things you say and the things you mean and the things you communicate are quite opposite from one another. And some of those cues are given through our movement. So we know, for instance, that people communicate a huge amount. We know there's a large body of research looking at our emotions and the way we communicate the emotions through our body. 
Um, you know, if you're looking out of a window and you can see one of your close friends walking by, you might be able to tell what kind of mood they're in based on the type of movement they're doing, just as they're walking down the street. And as they assume that nobody is watching them, you could probably tell something about their emotional state from the way they're moving their body. Now, what that requires, which is extraordinary, is that our emotional centres are linked to our movement centres in the brain. Um, and therefore, the way we move is linked to our emotions. But also the observer's brain is also tuned to pick up on those movement based signals. And we then make interpretations about those based on our previous knowledge. Now, what's even more extraordinary about movement and emotion is that different types of people might perceive different things in emotion. So it's not yeah. it's not a, um, you know, it's, it's not the case that when I could walk down the street and I could be jealous and you might pick up on the jealousy and somebody else might not pick up on the jealousy because that, mm. that looking at other people moving is an active process. So while we're watching them moving, we're actively trying to create a narrative or we're actively trying to create some coherence around that movement so that it makes sense to us. And we've done some research around dance and emotion and different types of people picking up on diff different movement-based uh, stimuli and, and uh, interpreting those. Oh, it's so fascinating. There's two things I'd love to pick up from that. The first is, can we talk about mirror neurons? Because this is something that I've seen very mixed reviews on, to be honest. Like At one yeah. point, it was quite popular, actually, when I was doing my masters and then it kind of became unpopular again in academia and I, I wasn't sure where it's at at the moment so I'd love to hear your views on mirror neurons because it goes back to that thing that you were just saying of how we interpret other people's movements almost through our own body in a way. Yeah now I think some of the controversy around mirror neurons might stem from misunderstandings or different understandings and sometimes an oversimplification of what people mm. are meaning about mirror neurons. So I think when Beryl, B-E-R-R-O-L, was talking about empathy and mirror neurons in movement, one of the things that they were talking about was this idea that if, if you do an action, let's imagine you're doing a chopping action, then the neurons in your brain which are responsible for you doing this chopping action, as I'm observing that action, you know, similar neurons in my head will be active as well and you know, there, there'll be a mirroring between what's happening in your head and what's happening in my head so that was some of the uh, original things but of course that notion about where things happen in the brain uh, is really controversial you know are we do we have a localist representation of things in our brain or do we have mm. a distributed representation of things in our brain so you know where exactly if you do a you know, what, what, so what, what sort of dance do you do? What, what's your dance background? Well, what's your main So, So I have here behind me, I have my uh, bachata and salsa shoes from last night and here are my point shoes. So I've mainly been Fabulous. teaching adult ballet um, over the okay. last few years, but I've done contemporary and lots of different things. Okay. So um, let, let's imagine you do a, uh, a coupe chasse pas de bore, right? So you do a coupe chasse pas de bore. And presumably, you'll have certain neural activation happening when you do your coupe chasse pas de bore. And so I watch you doing that. I've done that little movement thousands of times as well. So the idea is that the mental representation for me in my head will also become active while I, while I watch you do a coupe chasse pas de bore. Right. But it might be the case that it's not these movements don't happen in one discrete part of the brain. It's not like right there where, where this movement happens and therefore that activates that area and that mm -hmm. area will act, activate the exact same area that it activated in my head. Because if we think about, you know, a distributed representation of movements in the brain, then the, the concept of mirror neuron exactly doesn't quite stack up. If we think we have a localist representation, and if the localist representation is the same in you as it is in me, then that notion of a mirror neuron might make more sense. So, um, yeah, I, th I think some people, um, yeah, I, th I think some people misunderstand what what mirror neurons are all about, and sometimes mm. that oversimplification. Yeah, it's, mm. it's almost as if people think we have mirror neurons in our head. It's like there's a particular class of neurons called mirror. Which they're not. They're not. <laughs> and uh, so when people go, oh, it's my mirror neurons that are activated. Mm. Of course, that's not true because we don't mm -hmm. have 
sets of neurons called mirror neurons. It's just the case that, you know, if, if the same area in my head is activated in the same area in your head, then they might be mirroring one another. Okay, so is it fair to say that it's a useful concept to think about, but it's not accurate in the physiology? <laughs> is that fair? Yeah, and, well, I think we don't know what's happening in the physiology yet. Right. So this okay. is where there's a difference between, you know, a, a cognitive description and a physiological description of, of what's mm -hmm. going on. You know? Okay. So it might well be the case that, um, you know, during speech, uh, you, know, you might have vernix area activated in your head, or you know, well, your hippocampus might become active. Now, I know that you have a hippocampus, and I have a hippocampus, and my hippocampus might be active, and your hippocampus might be active during a memory task, for instance. Um, but that doesn't mean that the rest of the brain is localized for all of these different bits. So you might use different, you know, your your neural patterns might look quite different to mine when we're doing even a similar movement. Hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. I, I find it all fascinating. Um, to come back to my other question, which is around um, emotion, um, how much of this, and actually it doesn't matter the quantities, but let's, let's just talk more in general about the difference between are there universals when it comes to emotion and expressing emotion through the body and then one step further in dance? And are there very particular cultural things and that's just an interest i'm assuming it's both but that's an interesting question i'd love to hear your thoughts around okay so um well many years ago back in 2010 i did a, a study so from 2008 to 2010 i was doing some research in this area and one of the things that puzzled me was this notion of universal um emotions and labeling them with certain you know certain names so we had, you know, sad, happy, anger, fear. There, there was a, a number of, a small number of universal, very discrete emotions. And so lots of scientists were trying to understand how movement was communicating these emotions or how these, move, you know, how these emotions mm -hmm. were communicated through movement. So you had people going, um, you know, so that represented fear. Of course, so that one gesture and kind of uh, anger and uh, hey, happy. So there were these different kind of movements that represented, but they were just mi micro movements, really. And they were mm. um, they, they were very kind of, well, I, don't know, I don't know what the right word is, really, but they, 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 they were very basic. But scientists <laughs> were really happy to have this very small list of discrete emotions. So I put out a call to choreographers to create a series of dance movements so I wanted to look at the difference between how dancers and dance makers conceptualized emotions and how scientists conceptualized emotions. So at the time we were doing some research on point light displays. So we had points of light over our bodies and we were moving mm -hmm. in different ways to see what information was required to communicate certain emotional states. And so I gave this list of 96 emotion words to dancers and choreographers. And I said, just pick one of them and create a three minute piece of movement that might communicate those emotions, but try to stay away from pantomime. So I didn't want, you know, like, like oh, angry. Or, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't want that. Uh, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> and so and it was really amazing. We had over 100 people make submissions to us and and then we picked 23 of them and we took 23 of them on, on a, to a show with us. And each night in the theatre, what would happen, and we did a show at Edinburgh, was I would then talk about some of the science of emotion and, and how we study that as scientists. And then the dancers would come on and, and, the, and they, they would perform this thing. Now, what was amazing was that the dancers, who I think are much more intelligent than the academics, would often say, well, the emotion was happiness, for instance. But some, it's impossible to feel happiness, a distilled sense of happiness and happiness in complete isolation. Because sometimes when you feel happy, you feel a little guilt, maybe. You might have a sense of pride. You might have a sense of, I don't know, there's a whole set of things. There might be happiness tinged with sadness, mm -hmm. tinged with jealousy, tinged with something else, tinged with regret. Um, sometimes these emotions... They might be forbidden emotions that you're, you've been told or, you know, you must never be too happy because, you know, you'll, you'll fall. If, as soon as you're too happy, then something bad will happen to you. So people carry all these complexes of emotions with them. And what's extraordinary is that the dancers would perform their pieces and they would. And then we'd ask the audience what the emotional what the emotion was being communicated. 
And the audience always got it. And the audience always got that it was a complex of emotions. And they would, they would start describing these emotions. So then when you start looking back at what the scientists do again, and you go, well, like these scientists are looking at the body movement representations of happiness or of anger or of sadness, then I think they're completely, um, they, they simply don't work. You know, they just don't work at all because they don't represent uh, the reality of what it feels like to feel emotions and to express emotions. And then, of course, when, when you get to that, it's very, really easy. If you say to 100 people, what am I emotional am I representing? They're going to go, you know, 99 and a half of them are going to go, well, it's fear, isn't it? Particularly when you give them a forced choice of saying, well, is it fear? Is it happy? Is it anger? Yeah. You know, they're going to, you know. But when you ask people, when you see a real person moving, and this is why theatre is so beautiful. When you see real people moving, they communicate a whole set of emotions. And what's so clever about the human brain is that we can we can disentangle that. We can they have an understanding of what those are. Wow. I mean, there's so much in that. I love that, you know, there's this temptation. I, I totally appreciate that we can learn so much from distilling things and oversimplification can sometimes be useful. And that there's this drive towards like metrics and measuring and all those things. And so it's super useful, super important. But then I love that you're also bringing in like qualitative, qualitative. <laughs> I always find that word hard to say, oh. sorry. Um, research, how do you as a researcher kind of balance those two things? And do you have a preference and how do you, have you had any pushback Peter about you know, doing things in this way in the dance world. And I'm very curious about that whole process. Yeah, pushback from both sides, really. So interesting. <laughs> yeah. So I come from a, so I was a dancer first and I earned my living as a dancer. So that was, you know, felt lovely to dance. and I love to dance. And then I became a scientist and then becoming a scientist. I was a scientist within a, a quantitative tradition. So mm. within a quantitative, it was, controlling variables, you know, setting up laboratory experiments to test that when you change one thing, look at the impact on something else. And, you know, and we would measure it and we'd quantify it with numbers. And then we'd use statistical analysis at the end to look for differences and changes and all that kind of stuff. So that was the tradition I came from. And when I started to look at dance, I looked at dance from that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, then I started working more with dancers and I started, when I set up the Dance Psychology Lab, my aim was to bring dancers into the university so that we would have scientists on one side working with dancers from a different perspective. We'd have these two different perspectives coming together and we would understand each other's perspectives and we would try to create, you know, basically, if, if two, there, there's something about God, isn't there? Where people talk about there's only one God, but it just depends what side of the mountain you're coming up. You know, you, you have a very different view of the landscape. <laughs> And you know the, the the mountain that dancers climb and the mountains that scientists climb. It's the same mountain. We're just looking at it from different views, and we often don't I know that the other that person concept. is just around the corner. What's at yeah. the top of the mountain? Well, I guess truth, truth or, or <laughs> beauty. <laughs> yeah. beauty, love. I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> I love that. It's no, that. I love that concept. Yeah, but if we're trying to answer a question, you know, if we try to answer the question, how do people communicate emotion through movement? then dancers will have a very different view than scientists because of their tradition, they come from these different positions. So part of my aim was to try to bring, you know, to make a more holistic laboratory where we could study all of the, these things together. That's what I wanted to do. And of course, then I'd start to look more at the qualitative side and think about, okay, well, the qualitative position here is, is really, really, really important. And I'll get something else in a moment. But that was, a, but of course, my, my scientific academic colleagues we're saying, well, you can't, and you know, unless you can measure it, you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, these, our concepts only make sense if you can measure it, and if you can control them, you have mm. to control everything first and then measure it. And of course, the dancers will go, well, it's an entirely different set of uh, priorities. So now, when I take quantitative methods into some of the arts-based environments, you know, people look down on it and go, well, you can't. How do you measure these feelings? You just can't do it. You could, you know. And sometimes, oh, I'll get to that in a moment. I, will, I promise I will come back to that for those listening. Um, and so, the, you know, the, my academic colleagues didn't like the qualitative so much because it wasn't hard, you know, science, numbers, proof, da -da 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 -da. And, and 
art space people didn't like the numbers quite so much because they would say, well, you know, how do we quantify exactly an audience's reaction to a piece of dance? And I think some art space people and some health and humanities people become nervous that unless you can quantify something, it means, you know, the thing doesn't exist. Mm. But let me give you a concrete example of this. We, we were doing some work at the time on people with Parkinson's disease and looking at the impact of movement on Parkinson's. And it's really interesting that, so Parkinson's disease, I'm sure you know, is a, is a neurodegenerative disorder that leads to a range of physical and cognitive and emotional symptoms. And researchers have found since 2007 that when people with Parkinson's engage in recreational dance, then some of their symptoms become significantly improved. So you go, great. At the beginning, everyone was like, yay, this is great, 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 great. This is fine. And then, of course, we started to find out some findings where you don't get the effect. Sometimes, you know, not every single person who dances with Parkinson's is going to lead to an improvement in their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And not every type of dance will lead to an improvement in symptoms. And so then you get this question of, now, this is a very kind of scientific thing. We, we, we want to know as scientists, where is the boundary? You know, where does it work and where doesn't it work? Mm -hmm. you know, um, and some people in the dance for Parkinson's community got quite agitated by this idea that scientists were saying, in some cases, actually dancing doesn't help people with Parkinson's. Um, and so then, and then you see you have people who go, well, sometimes you get, you get justification that, oh, well, my friend Elsie, she, um, um, so I start singing things from Cabaret when I think of Elsie. <laughs> um, you know that song, when I go, I'm going like Elsie. Anyway, I won't go there. Um, so that Elsie with Parkinson's, let, let, let's imagine she feels great after she does a dance class, and that's fantastic. And let's imagine the scientists spent 12 weeks measuring something, and they didn't find any improvement across this 12 weeks mm. in this group of people with Parkinson's. Who do you believe? You know, yeah. we're, as we're both going to mountains, where is the truth of that? Is Elsie's truth enough to say dancing improves the well-being of people with Parkinson's, therefore government should fund it as an intervention? Or do you believe the scientists' position where they say, do you know what? We measured this for 12 weeks and we didn't see a positive impact quantitatively. So mm -hmm. there wasn't a significant effect of this intervention on these symptoms of Parkinson's. So where do you draw the line? And of course, my position is right in the middle of those two things, trying to bring this side and this side together to understand the nuances associated with that research. Yeah, what, what does that take? for you Peter in terms of just who you are as a person to be able to deal with that <laughs> this is a little bit of a selfish question because sometimes I feel squished in the middle and sometimes I don't really know how to deal with that as a human being and kind of stand my ground if that makes sense so I'm really I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. on that well it depends who you're trying to please um <laughs> if you're trying to please um I guess I'm not trying to please anyone yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to look at the evidence and go, well, do you know what? And there are some people I really like. There are some people who I like a lot. <laughs> well, okay. let, let, let's get this. Um, 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 I want to try and separate out the science from, um, from the personality in, in many ways. So okay. I want to be really objective about those two different things. Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing my PhD and after my PhD, one of my closest academic colleagues and friends, you know, became a really, 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 really close friend. Um, we disagreed vehemently about the topic we were we were both researching. And we would argue and argue and argue. And I remember once at a conference, we were going at one another in the conference hall, um, uh, disagreeing on, on, on something and looking at evidence and interpreting the evidence in different ways. And then afterwards, we were having a drink together and somebody the next day said to me, how come you're friends with that person? You were really, you know, really against each other's position. But the point is we were against each other's positions, but not against each other. Yeah. And I wish sometimes, um, you know, so that, that's what I try to be like with, with the research. Sometimes it really is the case that a piece of research isn't very good. 
sometimes the, we have to evaluate the evidence and you go, do you know what? This evidence really, really is terrible. And it doesn't really on its own answer a question. And you know, sometimes that's just the truth of it. Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm a, a great researcher or anything. I, I've written terrible papers, but um, I think we just have to be honest about, about that and look at the evidence rather than, and of course you get a lot of people having a vested interest. So for instance, you know, in some dance for health communities, people have a, a position and they want to defend that position because that might influence their livelihood. Now, of course, in an academic environment, it doesn't affect your livelihood. If I suggest that a certain model of memory doesn't stand up to scrutiny, or if I suggest that the reason somebody has given me for why dancing might have an impact on the brain, it doesn't matter to me as an academic, you know, whether I, I find evidence in support or against that position. You know, I'm just trying to find where, where the weight of evidence goes. But if someone's livelihood is based on that and they go, do you know what? I'm running these dance sessions for people with a particular condition. And if I've got some scientist over there chucking rocks at me, telling me that, that the evidence doesn't stack up, then this might actually impact my livelihood. You know, people mm. might stop coming to my classes. And so then you get a vested interest and you have to defend yourself against those people who have that vested interest as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for just giving us a little bit of behind the scenes because of science, because I, I feel like it's so, first of all, lovely to hear someone be like, you know what, I've written papers that right now I wouldn't go back and be like, this was perfect. And just be like, we'll make mistakes, we'll change the ways that we see things as we go on. And then also that you can have a disagreement with someone and still be friends. And I love that. And I wonder as well if we could have a little bit more of that between dance disciplines and dance categories and hierarchies too, because, yeah. you know, something that I work on a lot with my clients is perfectionism and just that, that it has to be right or wrong and there's no in between and there's no multiple perspectives. And I really appreciate that someone, especially coming from a dance and science background, you know, can articulate that, yeah, there can be disagreement while there's still camaraderie and there can be, you know things that you look back on and you're like yeah that wasn't perfect and I accept it and I still can continue doing great work today <laughs> yeah oh I think perfectionism is a rot that gets <laughs> into you and of course there are some dance forms that oh yeah I mean it's oh <laughs> and, and there's a there's a, another conceit around perfectionism which is now everybody is very aware and they go I mean it's a bit like the be kind move you've got people going oh be kind be kind be kind and then as soon they're, they're bitching about somebody behind their back after saying be kind you know what I mean it's yeah. there's this social thing about oh, everyone's very kind and then blow up and I'm still going to bitch about you behind your back I'm not going to be kind in, in private yeah. and the same is true of perfectionism everyone goes oh you know what we're, we're done with perfectionism in dance training we recognize how bad it is we're done with it I was teaching at a um at a, a ballet school um and a very, very um, high profile ballet school. And, um, and I was teaching the teachers and we were looking at this issue of perfectionism and we were recording the class and we were video recording the class because one or two of the, the class people couldn't attend that particular day. And we were talking about perfectionism and we we're talking about whether perfectionism is existing. What's going, oh, no, 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 we don't, no, 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 no. And then the, one of the people said, oh, turn the camera off, just turn it off. And so we turned the camera off. <laughs> And then they said, of course, perfection wow. is, of course. They said, yeah. we still want physical perfection. And they, they mm. still say, you know, we can't say it publicly, but we still demand physical perfection and technical perfection. Now, yeah. the only perfection, they, the only aspect of dance they weren't requiring perfection on was artistry. So if you had physical, you had technique and you had artistry. And artistry, you could say, oh, that's fine. We can let people be artistic and that's great. But they do need to be perfect physically and they will kick people out of the school if they're not physically perfect, according to their ideal. And technique wise, they say, well, of course, people have to be perfect. We have perfect technique. You know, that, that's, that's non-negotiable. Yeah. And, but as soon as, and then when the cameras went back on, they were going, oh, yeah, no, 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 we, we, we've gone beyond. You know, we, we, you know. So I think there's still work to do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because it is one thing what we're supposed to say and supposed to believe. And it's beautiful that those things have become, I think, more compassionate and <laughs> various things. But there's another thing that's just the reality of what's actually happening. And 
the expectations that there are in the dance world and the wider world. So yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that. I'd love to bring us completely different topic, although still dance related, of course, into why do humans dance? Mm. <laughs> the question, it's the big question. And I'd love to hear just where you want to start us off there, Peter, because I'm sure there are many avenues to go down, but what's your general, and perhaps we should define dance first and then ask oh. the question, why do we dance? Oh, should we not do that? You can believe oh, yeah, what yeah, dance yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's fine. The, um, oh, yeah, okay. Well, okay, a couple of t small questions. One, what is dance and why do humans dance? Now, I, I want to hear your view as well, because you're an evolutionary psychologist too, and so are interested in evolutionary perspective. So I want to hear your view too. My view on these is I believe humans are born to dance, and I believe that dancing has been happening since the beginning of human time, as far as we know. I believe that we dance, so some of those functions that we dance for might be perceived as evolutionary or have some kind of evolutionary advantage. So for instance, we dance as a form of social bonding. Mm -hmm. I really believe, and there's evidence to suggest this, that when we dance, we bond together. So dance might be like a social glue that bonds different people together. So that I think is really important. Now, of course, from an evolutionary perspective, those communities that were more bonded together, I'm guessing were more likely to survive than the loner who was living by him or herself in the cave, who didn't want to socially bond with anybody else, because of course they wouldn't procreate, they wouldn't then have a family, and they they are you know more likely to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, and that was that. <laughs> so I think the social bonding is is what one of the important things. There's a whole load of evidence from an evolutionary perspective about how people used to go hunting, and they used to run together um, to try to catch wild animals as a as a group. Of, of humans running together and then you know things would they, they probably run in synchrony with one another and then the things they were wearing in their bodies would start flapping against their skin there'd be a generated rhythm around these people and you had rhythm and movement so you know one of those perspectives might be that the second thing is that i know we we know that um people who are more physically active there's a paper in 2019 which showed a, a pair of gps wrote it that physical activity uh, reduces all-cause mortality, you know, significantly reduces all-cause mortality. So people who are more physically active are more likely to live longer. And I think there are so many health benefits associated with dance. You know, so we dance together, you know, we have cardiovascular response happening, um, it keeps us fitter, there's a whole range of things across our body where it's really useful. So dancing might have kept us physically fitter and physically stronger. Which is very important. Of course, the dancing in terms of thinking, the work we've done on moving and thinking, that notion that perhaps it's the case that when we move our body, it changes the way that we think. We we don't, um, it's easier for us to break away from set patterns of thinking. Now, of course, that might have an evolutionary advantage as well. If you've got yeah. a if you're faced with a, a set of problems, your ability to think divergently um, while you're working with other people, while you're remaining fit and strong and healthy. Is, is a, another important element. And of course, the emotional element as well. So we, our ability to communicate emotion and also to be perceived emotion. So people looking at us and, and communicating. So for all those things, the social, the thinking, the emotional and the physical, those are the reasons why I think humans dance. And um, and that's, that's why I think from an evolutionary perspective, that as far as I know, of course, who can know these things? I'm not an evolutionary scientist, but we know that there, you know, is dance, people have danced in every culture. There's no yeah. one culture where people haven't danced. Now, of course, there are cultures where people are banned from dancing, yeah. which is entirely different. But that sense of having an urge to dance. And we also know that, you know, when babies are born, babies are born with the ability to perceive rhythm. Um, and of course, you know, when you're being carried and before you're born, then you, that's a rhythmic environment. Humans are intrinsically uh, rhythmic. We walk yeah. in a rhythm, our heart beats in a rhythm, our brain you know, fires in rhythm. So we, we are all that rhythm stuff going on. So I think, okay, so humans, I think, are born to dance. And I think the reason they're born to dance is for those four areas of, of human. Thing. And also the human brain is pretty well specialised for movement. You know, there, there's not much of the brain that isn't controlling or doing something to do with human movement and the perception of what's going on and visuospatial processing. So lots of stuff going on there. And then I suppose, now then you've got that other crazy, crazy, crazy question, which is the both the easiest question in the world and the hardest, most impossible question in the world, which is what is dance? 
Now it's really easy. Um, you know, you've got some dance shoes behind you. When you put those dance shoes on and you could dance on camera now, and we would recognize that you were dancing. It would be yeah. easy to go, oh yeah, Natalie's dancing. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, you know, she's dancing. That's a dance. I, 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 could, I could do this and people would go, oh yeah, Peter's dancing. Easy, easy, easy. The, now there's an old philosophical question now, I've just had a shave, that's so why I'm a bit red and pink. But anyway, um, there's a, imagine I had a full beard, right? And it would be easy to say that I had a full beard, full beard of facial hair. And I pluck out one hair, would I still have a beard? And you go, mm -hmm. yeah, you'd still have a beard. I pluck out another hair and another hair. You know, how many hairs do I have to pull out before I don't have a beard? <laughs> and where is that crossover between mm -hmm. Peter having a beard and Peter not having a beard in terms of plucking out that one hair? Okay, now let's look at it in terms of dance. The same question. We can recognize you and I dancing really, really easily. And when we look at definitions of dancing in like the Oxford English Dictionary or any dictionary in the world, they give a whole lot of descriptors about what dance is, you know, moving rhythmically to music, you know, moving with other people in time. There's a whole lot of definitions. But for every single one of those definitions, you could take that away and people would still be dancing. You know, yeah. you, you don't have to have music. It doesn't have yeah. to be rhythmic. It doesn't have to follow a certain set number of steps of choreography. You don't need any of those things at all. And so the thing you kind of come to at the end is, you know, this could be dancing right now. I could be dancing. I am kind of dancing, but I might not be doing it with a rhythm or, or to a music. You, th you then get to the point, okay, where are you not dancing? And of course, you get that same question as well when, when you get premises, you know, premises used to have to be licensed for dancing, like bars and restaurants and things. You had to have a license for dancing. But let's imagine you didn't have a license for dancing. Could I be sued for walking across the floor in a groovy way? You know, how would anyone know that I was or wasn't dancing? So all these questions about when are you not dancing? So for me, it comes down to this heartbeat and for me, dancing is about human life. And if you've got a heartbeat that defines you of being alive, and I think then that's the definition of dancing because your body is dancing at that point. Your body is going and something inside of you is, is giving you the conditions for dance. So yeah, that's why I say it's, it's a, an easy question to recognize when somebody is dancing but it's almost impossible to define when somebody isn't dancing unless they're dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much. You know, the beard analogy is very helpful. I've never thought of that one before, but it articulates the point perfectly that, you know, we all want to draw these hard and fast lines and sometimes you just can't actually. And there's a crossover there. Um, yeah, the way that I define it, but only because it's useful to what I want to do and not because it's the correct definition is um, intentional rhythmic movement, but then it includes a whole many more categories of things. So for example, you know, you look in the military, do we want to call that yeah. dance? It kind of is, but it's not, you know, yeah. they wouldn't call it dance, they would call it marching or something else. And then yeah. playground games with like clapping and those kind of things, it's not dance, yeah. but is it dance-ish? For yeah. me it is. And it, <laughs> I it know is. people are like, it's not really dance, but kind of could be. <laughs> No, I, I think that that's the part. The problem is that the intentional rhythmic movement and marching is dancing. The only reason they don't call it dancing is because of the social label that's put onto dancing. There, there's a yeah. whole lot of baggage around dancing. And you know, I worked with a rugby team once, and I said to them, you know, there's a team of rugby players, I said, do any of you dance? They went, no, 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 we don't dance, we don't dance. They were completely, I mean, really serious. Like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. And then we got chatting. They were from uh, near Manchester. And they said, oh, yeah, we used to go to Blackpool. We go clubbing on a Friday night. And I said, oh, do you dance when you're there? And they went, yeah, yeah, of course we do. Yeah, 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 of course we do. <laughs> I said, well, I thought you said you didn't dance. Yeah. And they were kind of saying, yeah, yeah, but we don't do the sort of dancing that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, I was saying, well, I, I don't know whether you dance or not. And they were dancing in a club is dancing in exactly the same way as you do yeah. a ballet class, right? They, they, yeah. they are both dance. Yeah. And, and yet there's a baggage around defining yourself as being as dancing. Yeah. Because you know, when, when we've done surveys of, of thousands of people asking them why they do and don't dance, Loads of people say to us things like, oh, no, I don't dance because I'm the wrong type of person, the wrong type of sexuality, the wrong sex, the wrong gender, I'm the wrong age, I'm the wrong body shape, I'm the wrong body size. 
They have all this stuff where they think that to dance, you have to meet certain categorical attributes. Yeah. And if you don't meet those, then you're not, you don't dance, you can't dance, you're not allowed to, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And I think part of our job is to, well, part of my job, I suppose, is thinking about how do we convince the world that humans are born to dance and therefore it should be the most natural thing in the world to do everywhere. Yeah, well, we're on that mission together, 100%. I, I feel absolutely the same. And it, it, it's like conditioned out of us more than that. Uh, yeah, people need to remember, right? Because you look at any child of two or three, if there's music on or their friends around and they're going to be dancing like more than likely. <laughs> it's yeah. more difficult. What yeah. I realised as, um, as a, I play the cello and I was an orchestra and those kinds of things. I enjoy classical music very much. But at some point in my life, I realised that I have been conditioned to be still and silent while listening to classical music. And that I think in some ways, wow. that's why ballet is so liberating because you get to finally dance to it. And I thought, actually, maybe this is the unnatural thing. Maybe the unnatural thing. And that's not, to, sorry, there's no moral judgment on natural, non-natural, any of those kinds of things. But it was just a thought that I had. Maybe this is more conditioning than actually what I would do if I was to have free reign over my body while listening to classical music. So, yeah, I, I'm all for, and that's why I love, um, you know, broadening the definition of dance as well. Because if I always say to people, if you take my definition of it's intentional rhythmic movement, you want to do some things with your fingers here or you want to like do something with your eye in a rhythm like you're dancing it doesn't have to be like you said like you know in a jazz class and everything's going at the whole no it can be small it can be subtle it can be whatever you can do <laughs> and also yeah i mean you could take each of those words like intentional what if, what if you don't move intentionally what what if there's a startle mm. reflex and you, and you that gives you a sense but it's really two, yeah going mm. back to the the, um, that thing about playing the cello and being conditioned to be still and as if that's you, you talk about normality and you know, convention but actually more people die from being sedentary than they do as a function of movement so when yeah. we condition into our kids that they have to be sedentary I found that I used to find that ridiculous in schools where I still find it ridiculous in schools where people have a notion that you have to when you're learning clever stuff, you have to be a still, you don't move, don't move. It's almost like you're saying to people, look, we're pouring clever stuff into your head. And if you move, it'll all fall out. It won't stay in there, which again is ridiculous. <laughs> and then we, we play with our bodies at playtime. So we go into the playground and we, we can run around and play and play and play when we're doing trivial things. But when we come back yeah. to the clever things, we have to be still. And it's like, well, classical music is this hierarchically hierarchically it's, it's up there with the arts dance is down there typically but the, the classical music up there and oh yes let, let, let's sit down and be really sentry and let's be serious about this because it deserves a reverence it deserves a respect yeah. which is bonkers a human body that whole thing of sensory motor coupling where um you know you know da, 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 da. you, you want to yeah. move don't you i mean the conductor's allowed to move yeah and, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that, that's, fine. that's an interesting link. I hadn't thought of that, you know, how the classical music model and the educational model are similar in that way. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, I can 100% see that now. Um, yeah. And one of the other things that I like to talk about is just that I at least I believe I don't know, but I believe that dance and music do stem from the same capacity for rhythmic movement, because, you know, before there was recording, if you were listening to music, there was someone there moving rhythmically, whether it was hands, vocal cords, feet, whatever, yeah. it, whatever it is. And in nearly all cultures, those two very often are found together. Obviously, that's not to say you can't dance that music and you can't now listen to music without. I mean, well, I guess the speaker is still moving rhythmically, isn't it? I was like, is yeah. it possible to have music without rhythm, like movement? Not yet. Um, I guess it gets even smaller in the headphone, but um yeah, yeah. Th this is like so fascinating I love all of this stuff so can we get a little bit practical for the teachers and dancers here as we wrap up Peter um of your findings or of anything that you've been talking about recently that you think would be useful let's start for, for dancers um so my viewers are mainly people who dance um they take it very seriously but they're not professional dancers so they're committed to their dance practices, whatever it is. I know I have a lot of adult ballet dancers. Um, is there anything like encouragement or practical 
tips that you could give from a scientific lens that might help us? <laughs> Okay, well, I suppose um, the advice would come from a whole set of research, which is find dance is so multifaceted and you need to be dancing for your reason, the reason that you dance. And that reason is entirely valid. And don't be put off by other people's reasons for dancing. So let me give you an example. You might be wanting to dance for the sheer pleasure of, of listening to the music and moving in a group of people. Let, let's imagine that, 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 that that's at you. You, you let, let's imagine your technique you're not really worried about your technique you don't care about learning you don't want to do exams in it you're not you, you know you're doing it for that set of reasons well that set of reasons is enough entirely yeah. entirely enough let's yeah. imagine your reasons for doing dance is you want a cognitive challenge maybe it's that thing you every you want to learn a new bit of choreography because you want to stimulate something that's going on you know you, you, your pleasure you might get might be from that you might, you know, the movement and the other people might be a bit of an inconvenience. They just have to be in the room at the same time. What you're really after is this, it's like doing a Sudoku puzzle or doing a, doing a crossword puzzle, but you're, you're trying to learn these different movement patterns. And then fine, let's imagine you're doing something with technique. My point is with all of these things, find out what you really like about dancing and use that for your motivation. And the reason I say that is that there is some research which shows that people can be intimidated by the dance world. Typically, it's because they feel judged in some way. They feel that other people are putting a value on them. One of the things that I've found, I'm, I'm, well, I'm 58 now, and as I've been dancing since I was a small child. And of course, my body has changed a huge amount over that 58 years. And I, I still dance all the time. And there are some forms of dance, that some ways of dancing that I can no longer do, that I used to be able to do. I'm not as fast as I used to be. My memory, sometimes I go to a jazz class and the teacher's teaching us a whole set of choreography. And my, I'm like, oh no, I can't pick it up. I just don't know it. <laughs> what? I completely forget. And I find it harder to learn the choreography in some instances. Um, and over the years, what I've had to do, I've had to change my self-talk about why I dance you know yeah. throughout that so I used to dance I was dancing pre-professionally and then professionally and when I was dancing in those fields and for that reason then you know I had a certain objective you know people were paying money to come to the theatre to watch a show in which I was in and so it needed to be a certain standard yeah when I stopped being a professional dancer I, I my, my body shape changed my weight changed a whole lot of things changed and then I found it really hard to carry on dancing for some bits because I'd always have this thing of, well, I can't, I simply can't do that thing anymore. You know, I can't do as many pirouettes anymore. I can't jump as high, which means I can't get my legs doing the things I used to be able to do. And at first I saw every single one of those as a failure and a yeah. reason why I shouldn't be dancing. Yeah. And what I've tried to do from there is to find the reasons, you know, why the, I, the love I get from dance, but I have to be, super selective now about what that love is because it's changed because I've changed my body has changed my reasons for dance have changed and also the people around me have changed so some people go why is this old man dancing why is this old man coming into a jazz class you know um, and yeah so yeah so my advice to you as dancers is if you like to dance or if you love to dance think about your reason that reason might change over the years that you are dancing but keep an eye on that and let the other stuff go gracefully because some of the saddest, hardest stories are people, you know, for instance, I, I met a woman who was a ballet teacher and we were talking about ballet teaching and I was talking to her about what her history in dance was. And she was a ballet dancer. She performed as a ballet dancer and then she had a child and she had two children. And so she gave up dancing because her body shape changed and she, her abilities changed and a whole range of things changed. Her job got in the way and she couldn't do, you know. Anyway, her children about 12 or 13 and she was stood one day holding onto the mantelpiece in her dining room. And she did a plie and she said she just cried. And just doing, it was the first time she'd done a plie for years and years and years and years and years. But the feelings through that movement just came back and she spent the entire day when the kids were at school crying. And she then decided then to go back to dance. And then she qualified as a ballet teacher and she carried on, you know, she had a long career as that. But so many people stop dancing and then find it because their reasons change. So, yeah, that, that's my that would be my advice. 
enjoy oh, loving it. Yeah, it's such important and beautiful advice. And it's, I think it's so hard that concept of failure if you have attained a certain level at some point to remember why you started in the first place because you didn't start at five years old because you had to get to that level you started for another reason and that reason is allowed to still be there so I love that so much oh man and you know I think even thinking about that concept is great for the teachers listening too because we can't know and I, I talk about this too which is like we can't know the reasons why people are in our class as you just articulated there there are many reasons some people might be there for the community aspect some people might be there to express themselves some people might be there for techniques some people might be and combinations of all of all of that and can we as teachers allow that all to be there without discouraging or assuming anything about our students in the class <laughs> So I think that's really useful for both dancers and teachers. Is there anything else, because you've worked with so many teachers, Peter, is there anything else that you think would be a little nugget of wisdom that you can leave for us for the dance teachers listening? Yeah, so I think dance teachers, I think for me, the, the thing about mental skills for dancing is really important. And um, having an understanding of, you know, we dance with our bodies, but actually we dance with our mind. That's where it comes from. You know, that mind, uh, the brain of a dancer is, is so much more important in some ways than their body of a dancer. And so I think having an understanding of some of the, those things, as it's just motivation, goals, uh, perfectionism, having an understanding of that, bringing our own experience with dance into, you know, we, we can offer our experience of dance and as being a dance teacher to other people but we can't impose them. We're yeah. not trying to create, well, it depends what sort of teaching you're doing. And there are some dance cultures where people are trying to create those. But um, when people are dancing, I think it is a really, really vulnerable space when you're expressing yourself through movement. And I think as a dance teacher, those dance teachers are in the most privileged place in the world. They've yeah. got a room full of people who are, who are right there in front of them and prepared to give them their soul. And um, I think we need to treat those souls with respect and love. Yeah, beautiful. I'd like to ask you what you're excited about at the moment, Peter, in terms of if it's anything, re research or projects that you're doing or anything that you're like, you know what, this is a topic that's caught my attention right now, even if it's outside of dance or something. I like asking people this because very interesting things tend to appear. <laughs> well, the thing I'm working on at the moment is a project we've got, it's called Move Ashore. It's a dance for mental wellbeing program. And this is something that I've been working on with a dancer called Dame Darcy Bussell. And Darcy and I have been working on this project for a couple of years now, and we've released it. And we're what we're using it for, you know, people can enroll on it for as individuals. So it's a wellbeing program. And my wife is a therapist who's worked in mental health for 30 years. So the three of us together, so Darcy, Lindsay and me, uh, have come together. We've created this a, a 20 week dance program that has dance elements in it and it has well-being elements in it as well so that people can build up a well-being toolkit now what we're using what we're really excited about is that organizations or individuals are using it now organizations are using it as part of their employee well-being programs and i'm really excited That's about that because fantastic what it means is the i think my big thing I love dancing in studios. I go to a studio all the time. I've got my own studio just behind that wall there. And I dance all the time in the studio. And what I really want to do is take dance into the real world as well. And yeah. so when we can start, you know, we, we've got a client, one of our clients is a, a McDonald's branch. And, um, and they're using over 120 staff who are now using it. And we've got some other large corporate clients as well who are using it as part of employee well-being but trying to get movement and to change the way people move in regular work environments in business environments in education environments and in health environments so we see movement and we see a range of different styles of movement in more places that's really my goal yeah. that's such an exciting project and I i've seen some of um the clips and viewing Darcy dancing and things. So I have an idea of what the answer to this question is. But for those who haven't seen it yet, 
what type of movement is it? Because if people are like, oh my goodness, dance, I'm going to have to dance. Like, is it going to be very complicated and like you have to get no. ballet shoes? <laughs> no, 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 no. So Dar Darcy and I both wear regular clothes. Well, we're not wearing dance clothes in, in the video. So it's not, though our tagline is, it's not a workout, it's well-being. And you can wear oh, any kind of clothes. That. Well, anything that you can move in. I wear jeans and, and this shirt, I think. I wear jeans, and I, that's what I'm wearing. Now, Darcy has something called DD Mix, which has 17 dances. Well, we, we've, we've taken 17 of, of those dances and we've adapted them and we've simplified them. And it's really for people who have been sat on the couch and they, they're thinking, oh, I'm not a dancer, but I used to love to dance. And it's for those people to get up. It's a really, 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 really slow introduction to these 17 dances. And you learn a couple in week one and then you learn a couple more. And then you, we recap those same dances two or three times. It's really slow. And then after about week five, we start introducing a new dance and we introduce one new dance a week and we introduce a new dance and a new dance and a new dance and we weave them all together. So eventually you'll be dancing them without having to recap on what the dance steps are, but they're really simple. Some of them are very kind of calm and, and you know, you just breathe through them. Darcy's diverse dance mix are lovely because mm -hmm. they... It's a range of a diverse range of different dance styles from across the world. So they've been inspired wow. by different cultures. Oh, that's and, so um, cool. Yeah. And so that's what they are. And we have a warm up and a cool down. And it was interesting because we did the, we recorded all of them at the um, BBO studios in London. And then we have our clinical research group. So the clinical research group are people who there's a GP, there are therapists, there are people, um, there are academics, there are dance teachers, there's a wide range of people in our, in our clinic, and service users, people with mental health um, concerns, a range of people um, in, in our group. And they looked at them and the first said, oh, well, wouldn't it be really nice if some of those movements were done somewhere in nature? Mm. So then Darcy then came up, so I live in Cromer on the North Norfolk coast, and Darcy came up and we filmed the warm up on the cliff, and then we, <laughs> the cool, no, the warm up on the beach and the cool down on the cliff edge. And uh, they're all in nature, these two dances. And we're about to film some more in nature. So that, yeah, Brilliant. so, so, so that, that's the style of dance. So really, you can wear whatever clothes you like, and um, uh, they're really designed for people who who are not professional dancers. Yeah. Oh, it's such a brilliant project, and I'm excited for more people to get permission and then also a structure to follow yeah. because so I got married two years ago and during the wedding like for me it was really important to give people the opportunity to dance it was like one of my main goals at my wedding is like I need people to feel like they can dance <laughs> so I was thinking about the place and all these things and I was just thinking it's such a shame that people have to wait for bigger occasions like a wedding to feel you know I was thinking about so my aunties and uncles and those and I was like this is so fun like what a great opportunity for people to have permission to do it without having to you know, step into a dance studio, that the dance can come to them. I just love this so much. I yeah. think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, oh, well, in two weeks' time, I'm going across to Salt Lake City. I do a lot of events. And this one, I did I did it before lockdown last time. And we have about 10,000 people in the room. And they're all business wow. people. And they're not wow. expecting to dance. <laughs> and, um, and and then I my, my job is to, I, I run some movement moments with people. And so I come and I get the entire audience dancing and moving um, and um, because they, they're sitting there for three hours at a time, which yeah. is, of course, their brains are just, just going off and off and off. Uh, and I love that. I love that experience of, of providing an opportunity for people in the real world to, to change the way they move and to dance. Such a powerful thing. Yeah. So we have literally only scratched the surface of what Peter can talk about. So I'd love to talk about the dance cure to finish, Peter. Okay. Can you tell us about it, please? Oh, yes, the dance cure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's my work. <laughs> I've written two books. Well, I'm gonna, I'm, oh, I haven't got any. Well, I have. Oh, wait, wait there. Look at this. Um, this is live, live action. I'm, I'm going over here. And um, oh, let, let's take that one there. Well, I'm going to put it in my as well. There we go. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the dance cure, well, this is all the dance cure here. Here we are, here's the dance cure. Uh, the surprising secret um, to being smarter, stronger and happier. So this is a book all about the science of dance and about the wonders of dance. And um, now the dance cure really came from this book called Dance Psychology. So I wrote Dance Psychology in 2018. And this is the book that's got lots of science in the book. And it's, it's quite a critical book. So there are lots of times in the book I say, actually, 
this doesn't quite hold together. And mm. So this is this is a kind of critical analysis of some of the research, um, and um, yeah, and then the, but this book is a much more readable book for everybody thinking about how dance um, is wonderful for our brain and our relationships and our body and our hearts, everything. Yeah. Brilliant. So was the first one were you thinking more of you know dance researchers, dancers, people in that kind of more like we take this seriously, we know how to read the scientific literature, etc. What what excited you to write the second book? Like, was it a particular conversation, or were you just like, you know, what more people need access to this? <laughs> what was yeah, but it's exactly that, really. So, um, yeah, the, the first book was written for people who, because I, I talk about some of the, um, you know, some, sometimes you get an ANOVA result in there, and not everybody understands an ANOVA result. Um, and it's so but then I wanted to write, you know, a book that was much more. Um, you know, a general book that everybody can engage with to know about the science of dance, but in a really accessible way. So there are no equations in here at all. Um, and um, it's full of stories. And so I tell, you know, so people can read, I mean, I, I describe some of the science, but it's they're not written in, a, in an exclusive way such that only scientists can understand them. Yeah, so, so that's, Brilliant. and also I wanted to, um, yeah, I, I just want, yeah, I just want the world to know about the power of dance and the yeah. extraordinary impact dance has on, on the world and people within the world. So I wanted to create something that is readable by everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for doing it. I'm sure you hear people message you all the time to say thank you so much for this book, but yeah. it's so wonderful that the, there are so many bridges now between the world of like professional dance and non-professional dance and the world of academia and I just feel like all these bridges are being built and there's such a welcoming atmosphere. Like the fact that I got to have this conversation with you today, you know, and I'm not part of your university or I don't know, you know, people in the Royal Ballet and things like that, but that these conversations get to be had and more and more people get to listen to them and hear, hey, I'm allowed to dance. I was born to dance, in fact. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the whole thing. We are, we are born to dance. Yeah, that sense of being allowed to dance is the most important thing, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Peter, thank you so very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for inviting me to come and have a chat today. I hope we can continue this conversation as time goes on. Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching, everyone.